Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to so everyone participating in our webinar, Peronis Disease, State of the Art and Cl Clinical Answers. I have a little problem with the connection, so uh, I'm excusing for my participation with the picture, but for those of you who might not know the ISSM, my name is Anna Maria Giraldi. I'm the president of the ISSM, and I'm so happy to welcome you all to this webinar today. I just want to say a few brief words about the ISSM. The ISSM has a vision that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. So we also have, as you can see, a mission and a purpose. And we really would like to be the most trusted source of information, of meetings, and all aspects of human sexual health. And I think the webinars we are participating in now is one hour uh, fulfilling one of our purposes that we want to reach out with high profile research and clinical experience. The next slide, please. As you can see, we are reaching out throughout the world. We have regional affiliated societies in almost all parts of the world, and the ISSM is like the umbrella for all the regional associated societies. We have a, a regional society in North America, in South America, in the Middle East, in Europe, in the South Asia, and in the Asia Pacific region. So if you are not already a member, I would suggest that you consider being a member because you will have an international network within sexual health and sexual medicine that you can uh, reach out for and get inspired from. Next slide. One of the really benefits of being a member of the ISSM is that we have three uh, journals and a video journal. We have the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access, and Sexual Medicine Reviews, which all have an impact factor. And then we have the video journal, which has a focus on urological surgery. Next slide. So having said this, I'm so happy to introduce our two moderators and I want to thank you our moderators and also the speakers for using their time to keep their perspective of the topic of today. So it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Chung. Dr. Eric Chung is a professor and urologist andrologist from Brisbane in Australia. He just served as the scientific chair of our world meeting and um, is very engaged in the ISSM. We also have Giulio Giraffa, who is very engaged in our regional society, European Society of Sexual Medicine. Giulio originally trained as urologist and urologist in Italy. Now he is in London, has been working there for many years, and is also an associate editor of our Journal of Sexual Medicine. So welcome to both of you, Giulio and Eric, and thank you for moderating this session. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Maria, for the invitation. It's a great honor for myself and certainly for Eric, uh, who has dedicated all his life uh, to Peroni's disease and uh, to, to chair this session, which uh, will discuss about quite interesting topics uh, that are still uh, under debate uh, with regards to the management of Peroni's disease. And uh, for this reason, we have uh, invited uh, some of the world experts in the field to discuss uh, the various options for Peroni's disease. For this reason, I would like to invite uh, our friend Atesh Kadioglu from Istanbul, uh, who is one of the leading experts in Peroni's disease and who has written very high quality papers on Peroni's disease to discuss uh, about uh, the, uh, the uh, role of traction and vacuum therapies in Peroni's disease. So President uh, Anna Marie Giraldi, uh, Chairman uh, Dr. Graffa, Dr. Chang, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk on the um, update on the traction and vacuum treatments in uh, patients with Peroni's disease. Next slide. So this is the design of my presentation. I like to first discuss the vacuum and then the traction therapies. Also, I will uh, discuss, uh, you know, uh, shortly combination therapies by using vacuum or traction uh, therapy, and I will finally end up with uh, take-home messages. 
text. So a long time ago, about three decades ago, Dr. Liu did a very nice study in his lab in San Francisco, looking at the effect of the subatmospheric pressure on the simian penis, on the monkey penis. And he did apply a subatmospheric pressure up to 200 millimeter mercury on the penis, on the monkeys. And what he found was the expansion of cross-section of the penis to be increased by 150%. Mono, moreover, the cross-sectional area of the uh, you know, uh, corpus cavernosum uh, expansion was similar to that of the papaverin-induced erection. Next. The, uh, the mechanism of erection caused by vacuum erection device is similar to that of the natural erection. Uh, according to the guideline statement, which I am also a part of, it, uh, the vacuum erection device uh, results in dilatation of the uh, caronosal sinusoids relaxation of the sinusoids, increase in arterial flow, and decrease of venous blood flow. So that's the same mechanism uh, like we have described uh, in the past uh, for the mechanism of reaction, of natural reaction, I mean. Next slide. That in an animal model uh, in which um, the cavernosal nerve injury was uh, performed, and after four weeks of therapy, vacuum erection device has been shown effectively preserve penile size, and moreover, it increases also cavernosal blood supply. On the right side, at the bottom, you can see the uh, oxygen uh, saturation in the corpus cavernosum after vacuum erection device use uh, to be 88, uh, almost 90 percent. Whereas in the flash state, this uh, oxygen level uh, saturation was found to be 76. Next slide. In another uh, rat study, animal study, in which a peronis plaque was um, performed uh, by using transformer growth factor beta injection, uh, then the vacuum therapy was applied, and it has been found vacuum therapy to reduce peronis like plaque size. Uh, and also uh, improves uh, erectile function. In addition to, to that, the vacuum erection device uh, treatment also uh, showed a reduction of the irregular thickening of the tunica albuginea uh, after the treatment. Next. So there are two studies uh, out there published uh, with the use of vacuum device in patients with peronis disease. As you can see on the right-hand side, the level of evidence is low. And uh, according to these two studies, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the next slide, the average increase in terms of the uh, stretch penile length is uh, up to half centimeter. And the uh, decrease in the curvature degree is up to 25 degrees. Next. I will switch gears to uh, traction therapy. Next. The mechanism of action uh, with the traction therapy is different from that of the vacuum in this direction. Uh, the uh, collagen remodeling occurs via uh, decreased myofibrillus activity, and also the matrix metalloproteinase level is upregulated. Yes, very important. As you may know, the matrix metalloproteinase are responsible for the breakdown of the uh, collagens uh, developed uh, by the fiber, uh, uh, plaque uh, formation. Next slide. In a very nice study, our uh, dear chairman, Eric Chung, together with Gerald Brock in Canada, uh, they uh, were able uh, to show uh, the effect of the mechanotransduction, in other words, to uh, you know, traction therapy uh, uh, on peronis plaque. And peronis plaque tissues were obtained from 11 patients. And then it has been shown uh, by the authors, decrease in alpha actin staining increase in metalloproteinase 8 expression uh, in their model. So the, college, the um, conclusion of their study was collagen remodeling can occur after penile traction therapy in patients with peronose disease. So if we apply traction, then the collagen uh, is break down, and then uh, there is a remodeling, and the uh, tissue healing is uh, normal after uh, the uh, you know, traction therapy. Next slide. There are several uh, traction devices available in the market. Uh, for your interest, I am just uh, uh, displaying some of them. And all of them have a similar mechanism of action. That's the dynamic traction, except Restorex. Restorex was introduced recently by our dear friend, London Trust. 
And uh, in addition to dynamic traction, Restorox is able to also uh, perform contra-traction. In other words, if the patient has right lateral curvature, then Restorex is able to attract the penis to the left lateral, like we are doing a visceral maneuver during parent surgery. Uh, the penis is uh, bent with the Restorex to the contra side. Next slide. There are uh, uh, you know, several studies uh, in the, the literature uh, looking at the penile traction, of looking at the effect of the penile traction monotherapy in patients with Peronis disease. And uh, of course, there are uh, different protocols, different devices, but the summary of these studies are the penile length uh, increase in the uh, stretch uh, state is up to two centimeter and decrease in curvature degree is uh, 30. And in addition to that, there is also an increase on the IAF by up to 11 points. Next slide. So in terms of the penile uh, traction monotherapy summary, penile traction uh, uh, therapy shows promising results for patients with peronis disease. But at this stage, we don't know exactly the predictive factor, positive predictive factor for successful treatment. Uh, we don't know exactly who is going to benefit from the penile traction therapy. Because in most series, patients with complex deformity, uh, hourglass, hinge deformity, and uh, you know, uh, less encountered deformity are excluded. Next slide. In terms of the combination therapies, next. If the uh, vacuum device is combined with clostridium collagenase, there is a decrease in the curvature uh, degree by 17. And there is also an increase in the length up to half centimeter. If it is combined vacuum device, I mean with a shockwave retrotripsy, there is no benefit uh, according to uh, one study. So combination with vacuum device and with the recently introduced shockwave retrotripsy uh, does not seem to work to reduce the uh, you know, penile curvature uh, degree. Next slide. These are other combination treatment modalities. With penile traction therapy, there are several alternatives, you know, oral arginine, pentoxifiline with uh, traction, uh, you know, traction plus cholesterol collagenase, uh, collagenase, cholesterol collagenase plus Restorex, andropenis plus cholesterol collagenase. And the next uh, slide, and the summary is again uh, to uh, increase the penile length uh, up to two centimeter and to reduce the curvature degree by 30 at most. Next slide. So uh, at this stage, uh, it is not possible to determine the isolated effect of vacuum action device or an attraction therapy in combination therapies. That is the limitation of the combination therapies. We don't know exactly which treatment modality is causing uh, the decrease in the plant curvature. And at this stage, uh, according to the AESSM consensus panel, available data do not support the use of penile traction therapy before and after peronis disease surgery. And there are also not enough data to recommend the use of penile traction therapy as a concomitant treatment with oral or interagenal therapy. I mean, with pentoxifiline, uh, with cochicine, or with cholesterol collagen to combine uh, traction therapy uh, is not strongly recommended. We don't have robust data uh, to show the efficacy of these treatment modalities. Next slide. In terms of the, uh, the you know, side effect uh, of the vacuum and attraction devices, these are not uh, rigorously studied, uh, but uh, you know, there are usually mild and transient in uh, nature. Some of them are bruising, pain, discomfort, hematoma, et cetera. But I mean, uh, we don't need to be concerned uh, with the side effects, with the adverse effects of vacuum and traction devices. Next slide. The take home messages. Uh, I will finally discuss some take home messages with you. Yes. Next slide. So, vacuum therapy uh, as a monotherapy does not seem promising treatment uh, for the use of the patient with peronis disease. And it can be used as a part of multimodal therapy approach uh, for penile deformity reduction. It's both AUA and EAU guideline statement, and the statement is weak. Uh, on the other hand, penile traction tr treatment seems to be effective and safe for, uh, for the patients with pe peronis disease, but there is also still lack of evidence. Although we have two studies with level of evidence 1B 
uh, that's not enough to give any definitive recommendation, strong recommendation uh, in terms of the monotherapy for uh, Peron's disease. And both treatment modalities, adverse effects are mild, transient in nature, and uh, uh, are well tolerated. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Ates, for the uh, wonderful um, talk. Um, so the next speaker we have is uh, Professor Juan Martinez Salamanca, uh, who is a urologist uh, well known to many of us uh, who work in um, Madrid. Um, he has served on the executive uh, position at ESSM uh, and is the founder of the uh, Lix Institute of Urology. I'd like to invite um, Juan to talk about injectable, topical and oral therapy for Peronis disease. Hi, Eric and Ana Maria, for, uh, and also all the ESSM family for this invitation. It's my pleasure to stay uh, today with you. Uh, next, please. I'm going to try to cover the topic of, uh, I think you can, uh, you can do next and next, uh, the first and the second. Next. I think this is the natural history of Peron's disease, but it also is very well uh, known by many of you uh, that can cause uh, penile pain, erectile dysfunction, and deformity. As a three, uh, as a three main uh, symptoms of uh, this disease, uh, with a different percentage of presence of these symptoms, and uh, and also the transition between the acute to chronic phase usually takes uh, a year to a year and a half. Next, uh, also it's important to uh, to uh, remind uh, the high impact of uh, psychological and anxiety symptoms regarding Pironi's disease. And also uh, it's high prevalence in all <clears throat> developing countries. Uh, this disease can cause uh, a different percentage of problems also to the patients and to the partners uh, in both sexual and psychological sphere. Next. Uh, to my understand, uh, this uh, data uh, or this uh, um, uh, data needs to be uh, very well uh, taken into account when we are facing a patient with Peyronie's disease. All these um, um, you know, details of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the symptoms of the, of the patient need to be taken into account. The size and location of the plaque, the degree of calcification, the length and girth, the functional shortening of the penis, if it's previous circumcised or not, the degree of curvature, the accessory deformities, the presence of erectile function, and more important, the presence of risk factor for progression that can affect uh, the follow-up of uh, the outcomes of whatever surgery or, or even the, uh, the Pironis disease itself, and also the partner assessment. Uh, next. Uh, and the goals of the, uh, the global goals of, uh, of the treatment of this disease uh, includes uh, the erectile function that allowed penetration. This is a critical thing in all the um, decision process, if the patient is able to penetrate or not. Um, the aesthetic results accepted by patient or his partner, the appropriate size, the normal sensitivity, the penis stability, and the possibility to practice sexual relationship in, accord in accordance with their orientation and desires, whatever homosexual, heterosexual, and or vaginal. I think all of these uh, you know, data, um, um, it's uh, really remarkable uh, to, uh, to get and to uh, obtain after uh, whatever uh, therapeutic uh, strategy in each uh, patient. Next. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we are facing a lot of limitations on the available treatments, not only on the uh, develop of uh, new treatments, but also on the evidence that we are managing when, uh, when we are evaluating uh, these treatments. I think Epironis disease overall is an area of research that is still lack of a lot of a strong evidence. There are some few clinical trials, few multicenter trials, a lot of single surgeon, single institution uh, kind of evidence, which is not the best thing that we are gonna, uh, we would like to get. And, uh, but also, we, uh, but, but also we have some recommendation published uh, from different societies. And sometimes uh, we see that the many of these uh, treatment approaches are more based on intuition or experience rather than an evidence. And this, this is something that we need to change uh, between all of us uh, in the next uh, years, please, next. Uh, I think that the, we have uh, these three uh, treatment modalities, a conservative attitudes, uh, something like a watchful waiting or active surveillance, 
as we do in another uh, areas of uh, urology or andrology, non-surgical treatments and surgical treatments. Next. Uh, the patients that they could be uh, good candidates for. Next, please. Um, I think that the, there is still a, a profile, a patient profile that uh, could be um, uh, suitable for conservative attitudes, like the patient that have a, abscess of pain, uh, lack of, of uh, affection of the sexual sphere, for example, that they doesn't have erectile dysfunction, and the patient is able to do adequate penetration, deformities that are not affect the patient uh, emotionally, deformities that are aesthetically accepted by, by the patient of his partner, uh, the lack of interest in the sexual sphere, or that the patient is ideally in a stable phase and uh, is considered a phase with a high risk of progression. Next. Uh, next. Regarding the non-surgical treatments, uh, I think that we need to uh, uh, split them uh, uh, and, and also the objectives would be different in the two phases of the disease. In the acute phase, probably we need to be more focused on the treatment of pain, avoid disease progression or improve symptoms if the patient, if, if they are present. And in the chronic phase, uh, probably uh, the patient for non-surgical non -surgical treatment strategies would be the ones that are not candidates or refuse uh, surgical treatments. I think this, uh, these uh, characteristics are need to be into consideration. Next. Regarding oral treatments, uh, there are many uh, over the years that they, uh, they have, uh, um, you know, try and, and study and develop for this disease. Uh, many of you are aware of these, uh, PD-5, pentoxifilin, different kind of uh, vitamins uh, like vitamin E, vitamin A, tamoxifen, um, uh, potaba, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, the thing is that, they, um, uh, that they, uh, no one of them uh, have enough evidence to be recommended. I have another slide regarding this. And also we have on the other area, intralesional treatments like collagenase, interferon, and others with less, even less level of evidence like verapa, milnicardipine, hyaluronic steroids, or even uh, toxin and botulinum. Next. Regarding, uh, next. Okay, uh, these are the uh, different uh, pathology, uh, uh, physiopathological pathways uh, that uh, that uh, um, are uh, shown that they are um, uh, have uh, effect on the prionic disease patients, and also all the targets that they can um, can uh, affect. You know, the colchicine is decreased the inflammation theoretically. The vitamins are uh, trying to get the oxygen free radicals. The tamoxifen and the pentoxifen. Uh, can affect it and uh, TNF uh, better and the TNF global uh, pathway. The potaba can decrease the myofibrous activation and, in, and the nitric uh, oxide uh, can increase the, uh, the synthesis of arginine and, and also the, the pentoxifilin and PD5 could affect this, uh, this pathway. Next, please. Okay, these are the different um, the different oral treatments that they can be uh, proposed. The potaba, the metamoxifen, uh, colchicine. You can see here the mechanism of action that I already mentioned, and also some of the side effects of some of them. Uh, some are mild, another uh, could be a little bit more severe. Next. But in conclusion, uh, all these oral treatments uh, based on the EAU, AUA, and, uh, and SMSNA, and also uh, the International Committee for Sexual Medicine, and also the ESN recommendations published recently, and no one of these societies uh, accept or recommend the use of oral therapies um, with a you know, reasonable level of evidence in Peronis disease. Next. Uh, Probably the only two uh, accepted oral treatments, not based truly in evidence, but truly, uh, but based more in the, uh, you know, in the practical setting of everyday clinical practice, would be the PD5 inhibitors. That they could be a symptomatic treatment of erectile, erectile dysfunction. That many of those patients also are suffering at the same time. Supposed to have a role on the theological treatment, uh, trying to decrease inflammation, increase apoptosis by inhibiting the, the TF beta one and the possible pain relief and improvements of uh, deformities. And also the painkillers like the, uh, you know, whatever uh, anti-inflammatory can have a role on the, on the pain relief. Uh, next. Uh, Intralesional treatments, uh, I think that they, they are very well known how is the technique 
uh, to uh, to apply those with under local anesthesia uh, using this uh, one or, or five millimeter uh, lower lock syringe in order to avoid um, uh, liquid spillage. Uh, the subcutaneous and insulin needle resistant to entry in medication should be note. And the two uh, available, not uh, not uh, worldwide, but it's uh, still available in some part, some part of the world. The Cyaflex, the collagenase, and the interferon. Next. Uh, and here you can see where are the, what what would be the targets of the uh, intralesional therapy, the corticosteroids with this uh, general. Uh, anti-inflammatory therapy, the stem cells that uh, could, uh, as verapamil and another new drugs uh, still on development, could affect myofibroblast uh, activation. Verapamil uh, to uh, try to decrease the collagenous deposition of extracellular matrix, and the collagen is also affect this and could um, decrease the expression of uh, collagen one and three and trying to decrease the deformity uh, on the penis. Next. These are you know, the different uh, mechanisms, mechanism of action and the side effects, but I would like to uh, next uh, to point it out uh, that the only uh, one that is still have uh, any evidence, uh, you can go to the next, please. Uh, the only one that they have, uh, you know, any a reasonable level, level of evidence will be the interferon and mainly the collagenase, which is a uh, level, level uh, one evidence based on this. Uh, trials that uh, many of you are aware, uh, the IMPRESS-1, the IMPRESS-2, and, and, and many other uh, experience centers and uh, multi-institutional series uh, that uh, we have available. Uh, next. Uh, the collagenase uh, was developed in 1985 and uh, finally was approved by the EMA in 2014 for patients in uh, chronic phase. Uh, uh, mainly, uh, this was the criteria initially to get into the trials and uh, non ventral plaques, so, so mainly lateral or dorsal, with curvature between 30 to 90 degrees. Next. Next. Okay. Uh, this is the data regarding the IMPRESS 1 and the IMPRESS 2 and the, and the 1 2 combined. Uh, you can see here the percentages of reduction. I think it shows, you know, um, clearly biological activity against placebo. Uh, gaining uh, you know some extra uh, benefit from the patient in the in the in the um, uh, in the uh, treatment of, of this curvature. Next, uh, these could be some of the of the side effects. I think that the, you know after many years of using the collagenase, I think that we can say that the is 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 a very safe treatment. I think this is still no doubt about this. Uh, you know, the, the data regarding uh, side effects are, you know, uh, uh, very small, like chemosis pain, uh, but many of them are, uh, you know, very short um, uh, term uh, side effects and with a sp a spontaneous resolution. And the incidence of cor uh, corporal cavernous fracture, which is uh, sometimes very rare, also can be treated without any major sequels. Uh, next. These are some, uh, you know, new perspective or reflections that we are gonna, uh, we have learned in the last, uh, in the last uh, years regarding the use of collagenase uh, after uh, its approval. I think that we have learned that we can reduce the protocol with monthly injections, the London protocol, achieving the same results with two injections rather than four. Uh, also, we learned that the calcified plaques looks like a, a worse responders uh, to the therapy. Uh, also, um, I think uh, it's in the mind of uh, many of us uh, the necessity of the need of doing combination therapy with, with uh, we are doing collagenase, whatever with vacuum, whatever with traction, with the, or the technique tunneling that one of my fellows uh, described. <clears throat> and also, and, and most importantly, also <clears throat> we know that the collagenase could be an effective treatment also in acute phase. Um, yeah, like a safe and, and also could have uh, improvement in pain, in curvature, and in erectile dysfunction as well. Next. Uh, the interferon, uh, we don't have this available in, in Spain, and I'm not sure in Europe, uh, uh, show interesting effects also in vitro and in vivo, uh, and also could be another strategy uh, or alone or in combination to, to treat patients with Peyronie's disease. Next. And as, uh, 
And also the placebo uh, effect in these treatments is something that uh, needs to be considered uh, because uh, you can see that the, uh, these placebo effects in this specific disease could be exceed, exceed uh, 15%, sometimes it's up to 30%. And, and it's important to make all these necessary uh, changes in the penis and, and high, ha, have uh, this effect in, into consideration next. Uh, the shock wave lithotripsy, it's, it's also something that they was uh, really explore, uh, trying <clears throat> you know, different uh, uh, potential mechanisms like decrease of uh, angiogenesis or increase of angiogenesis in flux of progenitor cells. But there is no clear evidence of uh, this mechanism. And we are using only uh, to treat the pain, but the majority of the studies fail uh, to show any improvement on the curvature. Uh, next. Uh, uh, next, uh, I'm gonna uh, skip this. Next, 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 because also Dr. Kadioglu also covered this. Next, already covered this. Next, next. Okay. Uh, the topical treatments: um, verapamil, the gel H100, the dexamethasone, and the iontophoresis, plus or less with EMDA. You know, overall, we can say, and I think yeah, that the, all the guidelines agree that there is not enough evidence to recommend uh, those treatments in order to uh, ameliorate uh, penile pain, plaque size, or decrease in curvature. So, uh, you know, to my understanding, there is no major role for topical treatments. Next. And uh, I'm just, uh, these are my last uh, uh, two slides. I think these are, you know, key aspects when you are managing a patient with Peyronie's disease. Uh, I think that you should explain the patients what is the disease and what is exactly uh, the, the, the thing that is going to happen. Discuss the current treatment, uh, treatment modalities, making a decision served with a specialist, the patient, and also the partner. Overall, that there is a little evidence on the available treatment of Peyronie's disease. Surgery is a treatment of choice uh, with a definitive solution, uh, but uh, also have um, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of side effects. Conservative management can be used in the chronic phase when there is no relevant involvement of the sexual sphere of the patient and when there are no criteria to be treated surgically. Next. Oral or topical treatments doesn't have enough evidence to use in Pironis disease. A collagenase is the only drug approved uh, by the EMA of the, um, and also by the FDA for the treatment of Pironis disease. There are others in traditional options that are still in use, but up amylar interferon. Uh, so waves have only some evidence on pain relief, but not in the curvature. There is a little evidence for the use of vacuum and, and also uh, would be interesting as uh, traction to use in combination. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer your question during the, the debate. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, thank you very much for uh, your very clear presentation. And now I would like to introduce Professor Hatzi Christodoulou, who is a professor of urology in Germany and who has contributed very intensively to the development of new techniques in the surgical treatment of Peronis disease. And uh, he will discuss about the surgical options in patients with Peronis disease. Hi, Georgios. Hello, Giulio. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to um, give you a state of the art of the surgical therapy of Peronis disease. And I would like also to thank the ISSM for inviting me and to giving me um, this uh, chance to talk about this interesting topic. Next, please. So surgical therapy of Peronis disease is subdivided in three main categories. There are application techniques, uh, grafting techniques, and there is also the combination of a penile prosthesis implantation in, with correction of the penile curvature. Um, and I will uh, go through these three uh, main procedures in the next couple of minutes. Next, please. Starting with placation techniques. As you can see, placation techniques uh, um, lead to a penile straightening by shortening the convex side of penile curvature, as you can see on these sides. So this is an example of a dorsal curvature of approximately 70 to 80 degrees. 
And uh, we uh, perform an SBIT procedure, as you can see here. So we're excising small ellipsoid parts of the tunica albuginea. And this defect is then closed by sutures. And by closing these defects, the penis uh, gets straight. Next, please. So this is an example of a placation technique of a Nesbitt procedure. You can see here a, pain, a patient with Peyronie's disease and a ventral penile curvature of approximately 45 to 50 degrees. You can see that we already performed a penile degloving. We opened Bax fascia, we mobilized the neurovascular bundle. And on the um, dorsal aspect of the penis, so on the convex side of the penile curvature, we are performing the ellipsoid excision. Next, please. Which you can see here on this uh, picture. Next, please. And this is the resulting defect of the tunica albuginea. This defect is then closed by, by a suture. Next, please. We uh, perform interrupted uh, in sutures with inverted knots. Next, please. And at the end, we're performing again an artificial erection to check for the re result. And as you can see here, this is a very, very good result in a totally straight penis. So this technique is very, very good. Next, please. The indications for placation techniques in com com in comprise the penal curvature of less than 60 degrees, a penal length of uh, more than 13 centimeters, sufficient erectile function, and the estimated loss of penile length should be not more than 20% of the preoperative state. And, uh, and there should be no deformities, for example, in hourglass deformity. So these indications have been uh, proposed in the literature and um, should, um, should be respected. Next, please. Regarding um, placation techniques, when we look at in, in the literature, so this is a recent report published last year, and you can see that the results of placation techniques in Peronis disease are very good, um, given the correct indication and uh, the, um, the correct inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you can see that in regard to loss of penal length, it was very good. It was less than one centimeter in nearly all the published uh, studies. Next, please. So going on to grafting techniques. Grafting techniques, uh, they mean uh, that we lengthen the concave side of penile curvature by removing the tension of the penile curvature. As you can see on the left pictures, uh, you can perform a simple incision or an H-shaped incision in a patient with an hourglass deformity, as you can see here on this uh, left picture. And then this leads uh, to a straightening by lengthening this concave side. This, of course, leads to a defect of the tunica albuginea, which then has to be closed. And we can close this either by a graft, as you can see on the left picture, or we can use the sealing technique, which I will show you in a minute. Um, is, this is the picture on the, on, the right, on the right side. We're performing a partial plaque excision. And then the defect is closed by a self adhesive collagen fleece. Again, this is the penile straightening technique by lengthening the concave side of penile curvature. Next, please. The indications for grafting techniques include a penile curvature of greater than 60 degrees, um, an hourglass deformity or other deformities of the penis, a uh, short penis. Uh, this means a penile, um, penile um, lo length loss because of the um, disease, because of Peyronie's disease. And of course, the patient should have sufficient preoperative erectile function because uh, these uh, um, techniques uh, can cause uh, erectile dysfunction after surgery. Next, please. There are various grafts which we can use uh, to close the defect of the tunica albuginea after partial plaque excision or plaque incision. There are autologous grafts, non-autologous grafts, and also synthetic grafts. Synthetic grafts are not recommended anymore because of the side effects and complications, and they should not be used anymore. And nowadays, there is a trend to use xenografts, non-autologous grafts, um, of the shelf grafts, for example, pericardium, small intestinal submucosa, or uh, even the collagen fleece. Next, please. Next, please. I would like to show you the um, uh, one example of the grafting technique, especially of the sealing technique. Technique. So this is a penile curvature of ninety degrees, and of course, this patient cannot perform sexual intercourse, and that is the indication to correct this penile curvature. Next, please. 
We first perform a penile degloving. Next, please. Then we're mobilizing the neurovascular bundle. Next, please. And then we're performing an artificial erection test during surgery to check for the point of maximum curvature, as you can see here. And at this point of the, at the point of maximum curvature, we are performing a partial plaque excision. Next, please. And then you can see here the defect of the tunica albuginea. You can also look at the erectile tissue. And this is an example of the excision of the tunica albuginea, of the ellipsoid excision. And uh, this uh, defect, which you can see here, is then closed by the collagen fleece. Next, please. And you just uh, stick it on the defect. You have to mold it over the defect. And the advantage is that you do not have to sew it into the defect. So this is a very rapid uh, surgery. Next, please. At the end of surgery, you're reapproximating the neurovascular bundle on both sides. You're closing back fascia, and then you're doing an artificial erection test to check for the curvature correction. And as you can see on this example, this is a very good result. Thank you very much. Next, please. So um, we have recently published our data um, on the ceiling technique, our long-term results. Next, please. And these results are very um, remarkable. And I would like to show you just a few results. So the penile straightening um, rate at the long term of more than 300 patients was 91%. Erectile function improved in 24%. It remained unchanged in about 60% of patients and worsened in 15% of um, patients. And the, what is very interesting is that the uh, satisfaction rate of patients was 87%. And the partner satisfaction rate, which is also very important, was 84%. So I think that these results are quite um, good. Next, please. Regarding grafting techniques in the, in the holes or um, all around the literature. So this is um, a review that was uh, published a few years ago in sexual medicine reviews by my group. And you can see that grafting techniques can again um, 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 result in very good results. For example, the penis straightening um, rate was uh, um, up to 92, 96% of uh, patients. And the satisfaction rate was up to 97%, which is very good. So grafting techniques can produce very, very good um, results when the correct indications are respected. Again, uh, next please. Uh, what is very important after grafting techniques is the post-op rehabilitation program um, in order to reduce risk of post-operative erectile dysfunction, to enhance erectile function, to reduce the risk of penile length loss, and to optimize um, penile straightening. And for this uh, purpose, it is advised uh, to massage and stretch the penis, to use nocturnal PD-5 inhibitors, for example, Tadalafil, five milligrams a day, to use a vacuum pump, and also to use traction. Uh, next, please. Coming to the third surgical technique, this is the combination of a penile process implantation plus curvature correction of the penis. And this is the gold standard in patients with uh, Peyronie's disease who do have erectile dysfunction that is not responding to medical treatment. And um, however, if you, if you put the penile implant in, in those patients, you will often have a residual curvature, which you need to correct. And you can, um, um, you can address this by either modeling or placation or a grafting. And next, please. And I will show you um, in the modeling, which was introduced by Stephen Wilson and, Wilson and published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine in 2007. So this is a technique. Once you have put in your penal implant in the penis, you bend the penis to the opposite side of the penile curvature and hold it there for 90 seconds. So this is a maneuver where you break the plaques of the tunica albuginea, and this leads to penile straightening. You can do this in penile curvatures of approximately um, uh, up to 30 or 40 um, degrees. Next, please. This is the combination of a penile implant plus plication. So you put your stitches into the um, into the convex side of penile curvature. You then put in the penile implant, you're pumping it up to the maximum. And if there is a, a residual curvature, you can tie these, uh, um, uh, these sutures in order to straighten the penis. This is also a very interesting and successful technique. Next, please. 
And this is the other um, technique where you put the penile implant and combine this technique with a grafting. And I would like to show you the, um, the novel technique of the PIX technique, which is the penile implant in combination with the sealing technique, which I introduced and published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine um, in 2018. Next, please. So this is, um, next, please. This is the, um, the, um, the penis of the patient once we have put in the penile implant and activate and pump it up to the maximum. And you can see that there is still a residual curvature of 60 degrees to the dorsal side. Next, please. And also there is a severe indentation on the left corpus cavernosum, as you can see here on this picture, and also a curvature to the left side. So next, please. So we cannot leave it like this. So we are performing a, um, a, a penile degloving. Next, please. Then we, you can see also on this side, the severe indentation on the left side and the curvature also to the left side. Next, please. We are opening Bax fascia. We are mobilizing the neurovascular bundle. Again, we are pumping up the penis to check for the point of maximum curvature. Next, please. We are then performing a, a, a simple plaque incision on the point of maximum curvature. So this is the penile implant, which will then become visible. Next, please. We're then um, pumping up again the penile implant. Next, please. And we're closing this defect of the tunica albuginea with the collagen fleece. Next, please. Then we are reapproximating the neurovascular bundle. We're closing Bax fascia on both sides and then again pumping up the penis to check for the result. And you can see that this is a totally straight penis. There is no curvature. Next, please. And also there is no curvature to the left side. And, and, and as you can see that the indentation on the left corpus cavernosum is gone completely. Next, please. So this is again the, uh, the comparison of the preoperative state and the postoperative state. And you can all see that this is a very straight and very good uh, um, result. Next, please. So looking to the literature for this uh, combination technique of a penal process implantation plus uh, curvature correction. Um, and this is a report that has been um, published uh, um, last year. Um, and in this review, you can see that um, Either you're doing a, a manual modeling or a plication or an incision and grafting in combination with the penile process implantation, that this results in overall very, very good results. Again, given the correct indications and, the, and, and selecting the appropriate patients for this technique. Next, please. I would like to highlight that um, in, in the guidelines of the European Association of Urology, um, which I'm very proud to be a um, member uh, together with uh, the other two presenters uh, today, um, Atesh Kadioglu and also Juan Ignacio Martinez Salamanca. And in these recommendations um, that we um, published this uh, year, um, um, all of these uh, surgical techniques, which I described earlier today, are, um, uh, are um, listed as uh, real recommendations in our guidelines. Next, please. So I would like to um, conclude by giving you the 10 co-messages of my presentation. So I would like to highlight that surgical therapy is still remains the gold standard of penile curvature correction in patients with Peyronie's disease. A preoperative counseling of patients is very important and crucial. The realistic expectations should be pointed out and the long-term results of all three surgical techniques, which I demonstrated are excellent when the correct indications are met and respected. And, and what's also important is the post-operative rehabilitation and of course, follow-up of our patients. So thank you very much for your attendance and I'm very happy, happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, George, for a wonderful uh, summary on the uh, surgical technique for Peronis disease. I'd like to uh, invite both uh, a test and also one to the um, webinar now. Um, so I've got a first question to ask a test. So a test, you did a fantastic job talking about penile traction and vacuum therapy. Uh, yes. As you know, there are a lot of uh, vacuum and also penile traction devices available in the market. Yes. Um, so I've got a question for you. The first question is that, is the most expensive penile traction device the best? And the second question is, how do you advise patients to be compliant with traction and vacuum therapy? Because we all know that time equal result. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, vacuum traction devices, uh, they should have uh, the maximal um, 
So that must be pressure up to 200 millimeter mercury. If it is exceeds uh, 200 millimeter mercury, then it causes ecchymosis. And also even, uh, the, you know, peronist disease uh, like stain. So uh, this should be, I mean, uh, um, well uh, established and uh, should be not, I mean, uh, counterfeit or other uh, devices just to buy from the sex shops, etc. So it should be uh, a manufacturer behind it and it should be uh, FTA or uh, MAR, uh, uh, you know, approved. And second is the uh, for the uh, use of the vacuum device for Peron's disease, it is not promising, I think. For the traction therapy, I think the Restorex is different from that, uh, from the, uh, you know, uh, other uh, uh, devices, because as I said, you know, it has the ability to contract. I think that's a very nice idea. Uh, but it's not available probably in Europe. In Turkey, we tried it. Uh, I mean, I, uh, uh, you know, recommended to patients to buy it, but it, they're not cheap, uh, you know, from United States. It's only available in the United States, I think. Uh, but I mean, like we do this maneuver, just Professor Christodoulou uh, just uh, described, uh, is the, the contour uh, traction is a good idea. But I mean, uh, of course, the patient compliance is uh, low because you need you need to carry it for hours, and uh, the dropout rate is uh, uh, high, and also the uh, device is expensive, and uh, the data are not uh, robust enough to support the use of the to recommend strongly. Thank you, um, Julio. You got any question for the expert? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, okay, can we start with uh, Yorgos? And first of all, I would like uh, to congratulate him for the presentation. Very clear, very nice. Um, one question, Yorgos. Obviously, you are one of the inventors of the plaque incision and grafting with the collagen fleece. Um, plaque incision and grafting, obviously, initially uh, was considered like a very promising option to restore part of the length lost uh, with Peroni's disease because. In reality, there have been a few misconceptions when we say plac uh, plication surgery shortens the penis. Technically, it's not the plication that shortens the penis. The disease has already shortened the penis. So if you measure the stretch length before and after application, actually, there is no difference. The aim of plaque incision is grafting is actually to release the contraction and, and restore part of the length lost. But this is at the cost of potentially worsening of the quality of the erections. So the worsening of the erection after uh, plaque incision and grafting, the pre prevalence varies between studies. Uh, some are promising, but uh, there is a study from Professor Chang that assessed patients at five years while he was uh, reviewing his experience in London, Ontario, in which uh, erectile dysfunction rate is very high. So uh, Yorgos, in your experience, how do you select patients before offering them plaque incision and grafting in the sense, how do you assess the quality of the erection? Because many patients tells you, I have good quality of erection, but in reality, it's not the same kind of erection they used to have 20 years before. Yes, very good question, Julia. Thank you very much. So this is a very important aspect and I'm glad you asked me that. So according to our study, which we published this year in the Journal of Urology, the long-term um, erectile dysfunction rate is about 15 to 16 percent. This does not mean that all the patients are totally impotent and they need a penile implant, but by comparing to the preoperative erections, they have a worsening of erectile function. So it is very important to select the appropriate patients. So um, I do not rely on the International um, Index of Erectile Function Score because uh, this uh, tool was not invented in patients with Peyronie's disease. It was in invented for patients with erectile um, dysfunction, but not with, in, in patients with penile curvature. When you use the International Index of Erectile Function Score, the patients will have a worse score than they have in reality because they cannot perform sexual intercourse. So in my mind, this is not the correct or appropriate um, tool. Um, what I'm doing is I'm doing in all the patients preoperatively, I'm performing an artificial erection test to check uh, objectively and to assess uh, for the erections. And if I, when I say, when I see that the erection is not appropriate, then I'm also performing a duplex sonography of the arteries of the penis uh, to objectively assess the quality of erections. 
And only if I see that the patient has a good enough erection, um, then this is a candidate for um, a grafting technique. If I see that this patient has worse erections, then I recommend application or even a penile prosthesis implantation in those patients. This is very important. And it's very important also to tell the patient that um, the erections will not become better after surgery in no way, um, that in the best case, uh, the erections will stay at the same level, or there is of course a risk that the erections will decrease after surgery. Thank you. One question more, Georgos. When you say you assess the artificial erection in clinic, which is the right way to do, uh, how, what dose of coverject do you administer? Because clearly, if you inject 20 of coverject, yes. every patient will have a full erection, even yes. if has a degree of impotence. Do you send, do you use, a, let's say, 10 micrograms or yes. 7.5 or a certain value that yes. you would expect to give an erection in a person with normal quality of erections? Very good question. Perfect. So in most of the in most of cases, I am I'm injecting 10, 10 micrograms of coverject, but I'm deciding this according to the patient. So when there is a young patient, maybe 45 or 50 years old, and he tells me that the quality of erections is very good and he has daily nocturnal erections spontaneously, then in this in this patient, I would also start with five micrograms of coverject. And if I see that his erections are good and he can have an E3 erection or even an E4 erection according to the um, erection hardness score, then this is okay. If um, this is not enough, then I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing an, at another time point an, an injection test with 10 micrograms to assess again for these erections. And I agree that in most patients, when you're injecting 20 micrograms of coverject, then nearly all the patients, except for diabetic patients or patients after radical prostatectomy, for example, they will have some kind of erection. And this makes you um, feel uncomfortable. Should you do a grafting technique or should you put in a pillar enter right away? So again, to summarize this, 10 micrograms is the ideal dose in most of the patients, but please adjust it according to the patient. So every patient, every patient is an individual. Can I interfere, Julio? Can I interfere here just, uh, just to make a comment? Yes, please. The, the aim of the combined injection stimulation test is to have the erection uh, quality, I mean, oh. to mimic erection at home. So therefore, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, starting with the lowest dose, uh, depending on the comorbid of the patient is uh, uh, rational. And if the patient has uh, achieved the erection quality at home, then we don't need further uh, inject him, uh, you know, extra uh, vasoactive agent. So uh, I think the aim should be the erection to be achieved at home to mimic the same erection stuff. I do agree um, in, in most patients, uh, but there are some patients who you, it's my personal experience. There are some patients who you cannot rely on. So you're, you're not, you do not have a good feeling for trusting the patient. So, and in those cases, I would recommend just for also for legal reasons, I would recommend to do this injection test again in the clinic or in the office. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I agree with Yorgos because there is not uncommon that patient come to clinic showing you a picture of an erection which shows a degree of curvature, but obviously the direction might have not been 100%. Uh -huh. And obviously the degree of curvature will be less obvious if the direction is not full. So we might see a patient which we who we think has a 30 degrees curvature, we offer him a plication type surgery. And then on the table, when we create an erection, we see that he actually has 80, 90 degrees, which is a completely different scenario. Uh, I'd like to comment, just to comment. Uh, you know, first of all, I think that the, the response to the anthrocarbonous injection, you know, is a very interesting thing. But also, I think that to me, the two main factors would be the age, and the and the, um, another um, comorbidities that the patient have. I think these are two things that the, we you should consider, because this uh, question of this uh, borderline population between erectile function or erectile dysfunction, uh, you know, I think this is something that the between all of us. 
we need to be more and more focused and more and more clear using you know whatever nomograms or whatever uh, tool to this uh, to do this because this is a problem in the office when you are trying to uh, offer the patient or advise the patient to do a grafting versus IPP plus grafting you know uh, and I think it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very very difficult very challenging population one thing that the, we are offering <clears throat> when we think that the, the patient is at high risk of uh, de novo ED or worsening of the erectile function after the grafting is to offer a malleable. You know, I think the malleable is a, is a very good option, you know, especially the 9.5, uh, the patient is still having residual erection, uh, you know, glands engorgement and, and also, um, uh, you know, penis engorgement and enhancement. And, and, and you, uh, in, in some way, can be, uh, uh, you know, assured that the, still the, uh, the uh, erection is gonna be enough to have penetration. And also, uh, you know, at least uh, to my experience, all the reconstructions on the corpora with a graft, or sorry, with a prosthesis are much better than without, you know, you can increase the length, uh, you can prevent uh, graft contraction, uh, you can, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the final aspect, uh, even the cosmetic, the length, the girth is much better. So uh, for this population, you know, that are borderline between ED or uh, erective function or erectile dysfunction without, without response to PD-5 or whatever results on the intracavernous injection, uh, we offer them uh, to do a malleable at the same time, even they are not fully important. Yeah. That's well, a very good you. point for, sorry, sorry, you go, uh, Eric, sorry. Yeah, well, let's move on. We got we got a, quite a number of questions here. So um, one question for one is that um, you sort of uh, mentioned about the landmark study, the IMPRESS one and two, that sort of changes the way we do intralesional injection therapy. Now, as you are aware, and many of us are aware, um, Clostridium um, collagenase in injection is no longer available in many countries. Um, so if we were to look at all the data available for injectable point of view, do you think a lot of this efficacy outcome would have changed to become better if we actually do manual remodeling in this patient that have, uh, let's say, verapamil injection or steroid injection or interferon injection? Because many of these published study on intralegional injection doesn't do uh, manual remodeling. And the second follow-up question is that if we don't have the uh, collagenous enzyme, what would you recommend your patient to have if your patient decided to go for intralesional injection based on the cost effectiveness? Do you think verapamil is gonna be the better one or is it gonna be hyaluronic acid or is it gonna be steroid or is it gonna be interferon? Um, so what is your personal choice? Well, <clears throat> there are two very good questions. Uh, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a fully believer of the modeling or uh, so I think that the, if you are not having any um, you know, collagenase or anything that you can inject, or if you want to try with the old injectable uh, therapies, for sure that you should, should combine this with home modeling, with traction, with vacuum, with whatever thing. I think this data is very clear that when you add this so-called physical therapy to whatever uh, injection therapy, I think the results are uh, much better, uh, first of all. Uh, second one, you know, it's a very difficult, uh, difficult um, question, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, for us, it's a very, uh, the, uh, very special situation because we are doing a trial uh, with a Spanish company that is trying to launch to the market a new collagenase. So now uh, all our patients, uh, we are putting them in a trial. Uh, this is a collagenase uh, that is produced, uh, you know, in the oldest days for plastic surgery. Uh, to do to help these liposuctions and then uh, lipophilic injections and this company is very interested on uh, try to do this trial we already registered this on the spanish agency and we are just starting with the first patients uh, we are combining this uh, with uh, yellow runny days uh, uh, and you know now we are placing the majority of our patients in this trial but if you don't have this uh, you know probably uh, i don't know what the panel thinks but probably the interferon uh, is the drug that have uh, at least more evidence than the other ones. You know, I think that the evidence regarding the verapamil or the, um, or the esteroids or the other ones, nicardipine and others, is very, very, very scarce. 
So uh, I would say that probably interferon would be would be the you know the, the option you know the, the option plus physical therapy. Thank you, Julio. Question? Yes, I have a question for Atesh. Uh, Atesh, yes. uh, you are obviously a very experienced large volume surgeon for Peroni's disease and. When you discussed about traction therapy and you said that the evidence of the use of mechanical therapy after surgery is poor, what's your actual personal experience? Uh, actually, I don't recommend any traction therapy at, at some medical university uh, because the device is expensive. And uh, if I uh, would uh, recommend it, uh, I would recommend to use it after four weeks, three weeks. And uh, you know, the a patient, a, most of the patients have dorsal curvature or lateral curvature. And patients with dorsal curvature, if you incise the plaque, then the, uh, you know, the plaque is released and it is uh, difficult after grafting procedure that the graft uh, is going to be, I mean, a, a reattach or there is cause any fibrosis. But for patients with ventral curvature, I think, uh, which is encountered only 5% of the patients with Carroll's uh, disease, it is good idea to do traction therapy because if you if the patient has ventral curvature and uh, I mean mobilize the urethra and in size, then the penis falls down again and uh, prevents uh, I mean it causes uh, uh, fibrosis of the uh, graft. For the ventral uh, curvature patients, it is uh, wise to uh, you know recommend traction therapy. Otherwise, uh, in the ninety percent ninety five percent of the patients with dorsal and lateral curvature. I recommend Tadalafil starting two weeks uh, after the uh, you know, operation, have more oxygen and also have a you know, strong uh, nocturnal erection. That's my uh, treatment modality after the operation. And uh, Georgos, what do you think about uh, the use of PD-5 inhibitors like daily Tadalafil in patients who have uh, undergone uh, penile surgery for Peronis disease? Yes, this is a very important part of the post-op rehabilitation program. So, because um, a lot of patients would um, have uh, some kind of erectile dysfunction after surgery because of the trauma to the penis or because of their anxiety that they are worried when they have erections that something can be damaged after surgery. So, I always recommend Tadalafil, five milligrams uh, um, once a day and uh, starting about two weeks after surgery. So this is, in my mind, very important. And uh, when the patient recovers uh, after, let's say, four weeks or six weeks, and when he starts to perform sexual intercourse, uh, he can stop Tadalafil five milligrams. If he feels more comfortable with the Tadalafil, then I recommend it to continue to use it. And do you offer it only in case of plaque incision and grafting, where you know that the quality of the erection may get worse, okay. or do you do even in case of plication? Yes, I'm doing. I'm, I'm also offering this in patients where I'm doing a plication technique because I think that this is the same principle. Because, um, of course, you do not leave a defect open, but you have um, performed an excision, for example, in the in the Nesbitt technique, and this can also compromise erections. And therefore, I'm using also Tadalafil, also in placation techniques. Can I, can I interfere here, uh, Julio and uh, uh, Eric? Yeah. I mean, the ideal graft uh, uh, should be, uh, I mean, after uh, placement, should uh, be uh, turned toward the tunica. And if you look to the uh, histology of the tunica, it's consisted of collagen and elastin fibers. So the rational uh, behind, uh, you know, rehabilitation is to uh, have more oxygen and also uh, preventive fibrosis to, I mean, like I said, uh, for ventral curvature. For, uh, you know, collagen fleas is, to my knowledge, only, uh, you know, equine collagen. It doesn't have any uh, elastin in it. So therefore, uh, it is just put in the penis and uh, I wouldn't do, I mean, a rehabilitation for the collagen fleas. Uh, placement, but for vein, for example, or for extracellular matrix, for allograft, if it's you put allograft, good. that means after a while, this allograft is going to uh, act as an extracellular matrix, it's going to turn toward tunica or some, some tissue. But I mean, collagen fleas, uh, maybe the habilitation uh, won't be, uh, you know, uh, necessary. necessary. Yes. So, uh, but the extracellular matrix and other uh, grafting materials, uh, you know, although not evidence-based, 
I mean, surgeons feel uh, feel themselves uh, on the safe side to put some kind of rehabilitation. <laughs> of course, I agree. Fantastic. So I promise to give uh, hard time to uh, all the expert. So I'm going to talk about one case scenario. I'm going to go by asking Ates, followed by Guan, and then followed by Georges. So if I have a guy who has a almost a 60 degree curvature, but the curvature is located at the very distal corpora, literally a centimeter from the glands penis. So this guy wanted to have a less penile length loss as a result of surgery, and he wanted to have a graft surgery. So how would you approach a graft surgery in a guy that have a 60 degree curvature right at the point where the corpora body meet the glands penis? Is there any sort of um, caveat or uh, special tips that you really need to uh, advise the audience on how to tackle this problem? Um, I'll start with our test and then we'll go with Juan and then followed by Georges. This is very rare. I mean, a uh, 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 distal deformity. We usually have, uh, you know, uh, the dorsal deformity at the middle of the penis, but I have uh, also uh, come across with distal argulas and the uh, dissection of the uh, glass penis uh, needs a special, uh, you know, attention. And, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, of course, the, or the concern is the glass necrosis. And uh, the second point is, uh, uh, you know, after having, uh, if you decide to perform a, a you know, a grafting at the distal part, if you have still enough time, enough space uh, at the distal part to put the graft, it's okay. But it is at the very tip of the glands, then uh, you will rely on the graft and it can have a you know, soft uh, uh, glands phenomenon. So uh, I would, uh, of course, if there is just uh, uh, you know, enough place after the incision, uh, I would put uh, graft, uh, grafting in the dissection is difficult. Uh, you know, the arteries are uh, uh, at the site, uh, spreading uh, toward the uh, uh, urethra uh, at the site of the, uh, you know, glands. Uh, also, the uh, deep dorsal vein has also branches, you know, uh, at the distal part. It's also difficult to dissect the deep dorsal vein underneath uh, on, on the tunica. It's a very difficult operation. It's challenging. And for the beginners, I don't recommend it. It's better to do plication from the ventral side. But if you decide and patient insists to do, uh, you know, uh, incision and grafting, I would proceed with it. Thank you. Uh, Joan, 